Scripture reading this morning will be from Philippians 4, verses 10 through 13. Philippians 4, 10 through 13. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to, be, how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, what a glorious day. What a wonderful time to come and be reminded of the great promises that we have in God. A time when the world is starting to finally focus on the great I Am. We come together to worship Him as we always do, as the great I Am. How thankful I am to be able to do that with our family here at the Brighton Church of Christ. And if you're visiting with us, we want you to know how much you're not just welcome here, but wanted here. You're wanted as part of the family to join us on our way home as we draw closer and closer to God. You know, the Bible says the days are evil. We need to redeem the time. The days are evil because they're against us. They're running out. And if we just think about this life, then we'll be sorely saddened in the next We've been engaged for a while now in the study of the book of Philippians. Today we will finish Philippians. Yay! <laughs> it's been one of my favorite studies because it reminds me of the great joy that we share, the great joy that we have in Christ, the great joy that, that, that the world needs. and They need to see it in our lives so that they can want it in their own lives. The story is told of a bright young pre-med student, a sophomore at Stanford University who was, who was going through the, the tests and the, the burdens of, of studying at a high level. His parents thought it would be good to give him a break during his sophomore and junior year, and they bought him a ticket to the Far East to go experience parts of the world that he'd never experienced before. While he was there, he met a monk who said to him, don't you see that how you are living is poisoning your soul? This is not how you're supposed to live. He said, your idea of happiness was to, to stay up all night studying for the next exam so you could get a better grade than your best friend. Your idea of the perfect marriage is not to find the woman who will be right for you and make your life whole, but it is to win the girl that everyone else wants and make her your wife. The monk said, that's not how people are supposed to live. You need to give that up. And he invited the young man. He said, come and, and join us in, in an atmosphere where we, we love and, 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 and share everything with each other. The young man had gone through four years at a highly competitive prep school, two years of pre-med education at Stanford University. Under the rigors and the turmoil or uh, uh, toil that he had gone under, he was, he was overstressed, he was about to explode, and he was, he was ripe for someone to come to him and say, there is a better way, a more peaceful way. And so he, he called his parents, and he told them, I'm not coming home. I've learned a new way of life, and I'm going to join the ashram and stay with these people. And they didn't hear from him for six months. Finally, after six months, they, they got a letter from their son, and it said, Mom, Dad, I, I know that you weren't happy with the decision that I made last summer, but I want to tell you how happy it has made me. For the first time in my life, I'm at peace. Here there is no competition, no hustling and bustling, no trying to get ahead of everyone else. Here we are all equal 
And we all share the same things. This way of life is so in harmony and in tune with my inner essence, with my soul, that in, in, in only six months, I've become the number two disciple at the Shram. And I think by June, I can be number one. American society has, has often been uh, called the, the rat race, uh, that, that we're trying to get ahead of one another and others. And it's a reference to the idea of being busy trying to get ahead of the other rats to get the cheese before anyone else can. And what we have found is that it is a very harried lifestyle. It breeds stress and burnout and jealousy among our peers, among our family, among those that we ought to love. Is keeping up with the Joneses really the good life that God wants for us? Or is His joy for the world something entirely different? As Paul closes his letter to the Philippians, he gets back really to the original purpose of thanking the church there for their generous gift sent to him while he was in prison. But in his gratitude, he teaches an invaluable lesson about the joy of contentment. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 10 this morning. We're going to continue through the end of the chapter. But when we talk about contentment, we need to look at what Paul says in these last few verses about the things that support his contentment. We were this morning in our class, if you happen to be with us, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and in the opening of 6, we, we see that this idea of contentment, no matter what is happening in the world around us, no matter what we may have or may not have, is important to Solomon and it's important to Paul and it ought to be important to us because it, it defines or partially defines our relationship with God. So how can we have contentment when everyone else is looking to get that extra dime? When the word that best defines our culture, our society, is more. More money. More power. More respect. We want more. More, more, and more. How how can we begin to live in contentment? I think the first key that Paul identifies for us is that he was content with Christ's power. Look at what he says in verse 10. When it says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. And then he goes into, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Contentment is the state of satisfaction, to recognize that what you have is satisfying to you. For the Stoics, the Greek philosophers, who themselves were the stalwarts of the, the Greek religion or the Greek philosophical scene, they viewed contentment as one of the greatest human virtues that one could have. And they defined contentment as self-sufficiency. In classical Greek writings, this word that Paul uses here, contentment, is most often used among the Stoic philosophers. And they're always defining it as the being sufficient in yourself so that you're not dependent upon others for your happiness. You're not dependent upon other things for your happiness, that you are self-sufficient. Today, we talk about those who are stoicers, those who are, are facing life with, with no apparent change in attitude, no apparent change in emotion or, or uh, understanding. It's, it's all the same. They're the, uh, uh, the, the Vulcans of our modern society that do not show any kind of emotion. But Paul learned contentment in every situation. But what's interesting is that Paul wasn't focused on self-sufficiency, it wasn't because Paul was, was meeting face or life head on, but, but instead of being self-sufficient, Paul, Paul really identifies for us something new, the idea of Christ sufficiency, that I am sufficient, I am satisfied because of Christ. Paul rejoices greatly because they had revived their support for him. Uh, for some reason, their former support was cut off. 
and, um, and the opportunity to start it up has now presented itself again to them, and they immediately jump in and start to support Paul. Paul needed this kind of support. He was God's apostle in need. Uh, he had suffered much during his ministry. Think about uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 11. Paul says, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm speaking like a madman, he says, with far more labors, and far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Sounds similar to what he was talking about in his pedigree in Philippians chapter 3. They have confidence in the flesh. I more. He says, are, are, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Yet through all of this, it says, he was satisfied. He was satisfied with what he had. It's, it's hard to imagine someone going through this kind of persecution still being satisfied, but what he had was God. And God was enough. He didn't need the luxurious home. He didn't need the fastest horse. He only needed God. And notice he says that he had learned, learned to be content. It's not something that he was innately born with. It's not something that uh, uh, was natural to him or anybody else. It is something learned. How did he learn it? He experienced it. He went through it. He knew God. He knew Christ. And he had them in his possession, and that was enough for him. And so when there, was, when there was too much month at the end of the money and food was scarce, Paul learned contentment, and that's the kind of contentment we need. But what's amazing is as you read now in verse 12, he says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger abundance, and need. Paul also, also needed to learn how to live in prosperity. Think about that. Sometimes it's hard to live in prosperity. Thomas Carlyle once observed that adversity is hard on a man, but for one man who can stand prosperity, there are a hundred who will stand adversity. In other words, sometimes it's harder to face prosperity, because in prosperity we become that self-sufficient, trusting in self. It's all about me. When we're in adversity, it's then that we recognize the power of friendships and the power of, of, of relationships that we have with others and the powers that are outside of ourselves. It's in prosperity that we think the power is all in ourselves. So we need to learn not just how to be content in adversity. We need to learn how to be content in prosperity. Of course, Paul's secret wasn't just a, a, a mechanical self-discipline uh, or, or a fixed resolution. I'm going to be this way no matter what. Paul's success in contentment was a cooperative effort between him and Jesus. You see, when God is enough for us, our deepest desire is to please Him. The strength to face any circumstance with sufficiency then becomes Jesus. I can do all things, verse 13, through Him who strengthens me. It's amazing. We, we take this verse and, and, and you see it written on the, the, the eye tape of football players, Philippians 4.13. You see it in banners at sporting events. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 
and it's so wildly out of context. What Paul is saying is, I can be in poverty or in prosperity because Christ is my power to be content. That's what he's saying. He's not necessarily saying that, that, that Christ strengthens me in everything of life. Paul is saying he's, he strengthens me to be content when I abound and when I'm abased. When, when I come to the table and there's a feast and when I come to the table and there's nothing on it. Because I have Christ, I have enough. And that, brethren, is when, we, when your people talk about a, a personal relationship with Jesus, that's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about what Paul would say earlier in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. That's it. That is enough for me to be happy and to be content, to rejoice in this life because I have Christ. Oh, but do you have a car? No. Do you have a home? No. Do you have enough food? No. But I have Christ, and that's enough for me. That's contentment. Paul wasn't just content with the power of Christ, though he was content with the people of Christ. Jesus had surrounded him with a support group that encouraged him. Notice as you get into to verse 14, he says, um, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. <laughs> what had they done? They had shared his trouble. Paul now turns back to the thanksgiving that, that for the gift yeah, in, in verse 10, he, he comes back to it after this small excursion in verses uh, 11 through 13. Now he comes back to it in verse 14, and he focuses on their support and, and the support of other Christians. Uh, that support of people was part of the strengthening presence of Christ in Paul's life. And it is in ours as well. He goes on, and you Philippians... You yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into par partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent help for me, my needs once and again. Not, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and, have, and more, and I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gift that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Paul recounts their history of the rela their relationship. It says, at the beginning uh, of his work, only the church at Philippi uh, partnered with him. He says, when I moved on, and I was in Thessalonica, you helped me there. He says, now, uh, in, in, in verse 15, now you are, uh, you're sharing my troubles. Sorry, verse 14, you are sharing my troubles. What's interesting, the root word for that sharing and that partnership is the word koinonia, fellowship. You had fellowship with me. Uh, we had fellowship together. You are sharing in my troubles. You are lifting my burdens. Paul would say in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. He's telling the Philippians, you are carrying my load with me, sharing in the troubles that I face. His joy isn't in the gift. He's not glad that he received whatever sum of money it was. Although, Research shows that even during that time, legal fees, when you were on trial, could be quite expensive, especially in the court of Caesar. And so he needed money. But he doesn't tell them he rejoices that he got all of this money from them. He rejoices in the fruit that increases to their credit. He rejoiced because it was, it was a benefit to them. They were showing growth. They were showing closeness to Christ. And, and remember what Jesus would say in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. Peter reminds us that, or Paul reminds us that it is more blessed to give than to receive. How ironic in the season of giving. It is more blessed to give than to receive. What does that mean? Well, Paul tells us right here, uh, uh, their gift was a blessing to themselves. He says what, 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 what you have done increases uh, uh, to your credit. Now, Paul doesn't want to overlook the fact that 
Yes, it's helped him. And so uh, it was a blessing to Paul. In fact, he would say that he has received full payment, that he is what well supplied or fully supplied. He has what he needs. His needs have been met. But it doesn't stop there. Their gift to him was a blessing also to God. Notice, he says that it was a fragrant offering, a, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. That's why it's more blessed to give than to receive because it's a blessing to more than just the one who receives. It's a blessing to all. And so in the the final greetings, Paul mentions uh, 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 three groups of people. We'll skip down to verse 21 very quickly. He says, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Three different groups, the brothers that are with Paul, the every saint, and the saints of Caesar's household. Paul was rarely alone. He was always surrounded by brothers and sisters that ministered and cheered him on his way. J.B. Lightfoot in his commentary mentions some of those who were surrounding Paul during this time at prison. He says, His youthful disciple and associate Timothy seems to have been with him during nearly the whole of his captivity. Luke, the beloved physician, now his fellow laborer and perhaps even his medical attendant at this time, hereafter his biographer, is constantly by his side. Philippi had dispatched Epaphroditus, and he was there. Aristarchus is present from Thessalonica. Delegates from the Asiatic churches were with him. Tychicus, a native of the Roman province of Asia, the apostle's companion both in earlier days and later days, and Epaphras, the evangelist of Colossae. They are all there with him. That's his support group. That's the people of Christ that are helping him find his contentment. The second group, he says, all the saints. Likely, he's referring to the saints at Rome All the saints at Rome are are sending greetings to you as well. When we go to the book of Romans, and in the end of the book of Romans, he's greeting different people at the church of Rome by name. People like Priscilla, Aquila, Eponatus, Mary, Andronicus, Junia, Ampliatus, Urbanus, Stachus, Apollos, Aristobulus, Herodion, uh, Tryphena, and Tryphonus. Persis, Rufus, Asyncritus, Phlegon. I love that name, Phlegon. John, if it's a boy, Phlegon. <laughs> Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, Philologus, Julia, Nerus, and Olympus. Doubtless some of these Christians were still at Rome. They too were ministering to Paul. And then Paul Paul says, those of Caesar's household, which which was a demonstration of something he had stated earlier when he says that that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. How far had it advanced? It advanced into Caesar's household. You think about Rome having swelled with Roman elites who were attached to, to, to Nero and and his household, slaves and servants and senators and soldiers and advisors, they they all had potentially heard the testimony of Paul. And what we find is that some of them obeyed. You see how they have come together, these many Christians, to support him. David Jeremiah in Jeremiah in his book Turning to Joy said, looking over the entire scene, it is amazing to see how God met his apostles' needs through a support system in Philippi and a support system in Rome. Paul's serenity was the result of this support from the people of God. We could go through this building and name people by name, and the support and the encouragement, the strength that we draw from one another. How thankful we are that we can be content with Christ's people. The final buttress of Paul's contentment and serenity was the promise of God's Christ. The promise that they gave to him. A promise that he himself, Paul, had basked in 
and a promise that he desired for the Philippians to share in. Notice back in verse 19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in the glory in Christ Jesus to our God and Father be glory forever. Amen. The grace, verse 23, of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. God will supply our need. This promise is for those who are sacrificially following and giving to the needs of others, specifically the, as the Philippians had done for Paul. Trust is the, the conduit through which God supplies. He works through our trust in Him. The Philippians trusted in God enough to give and give and give. As a result, they would receive. This promise that we see uh, in, in this particular passage, he says uh, that it is a, a, a personal uh, uh, promise because it is my God. Notice, my God will supply your every need. It is positive in, in that it is something God will be doing on their benefit, shall supply or will supply. It, it is pointed all your needs. This, this is the, the things that we long for, the things that we desire for, the, the things that we need in this life. God is going to supply them. And it is plentiful because it is according to the riches in the glory that is in Christ Jesus. According to the riches. How, much, how many riches does God have? What's the limit on His supply to give to us? And finally, it is powerful. It is in Christ Jesus. Jesus, there's nothing my God cannot do, right? F.B. Myers observed how God supplied the need of those who supplied the needs of others. He said, lend your boat for a whole afternoon to Christ that, he may, that it may be his floating pulpit and he will return it to you laden with fish. Place your upper room at his disposal for a single meal, and he will fill it with the whole house with the Holy Spirit of Pentecost. Place in his hands your barley loaves and fish, and he will not only satisfy your hungry, but add 12 basketfuls of fragments. The Philippians sent three or four presents to a suffering and much needing servant of God. And from that moment, they might reckon that every need of theirs would be supplied. Such small acts on our part are recompensed with such vast returns. We scratch the surface of the soil, insert a few little seeds, and within months, the acreage is covered in a prolific harvest in which a hundredfold is given for every grain that we seemingly threw away. You see, God refuses to be in debt to any man. There's a promise here. And Paul says, it brings my contentment. Because no matter what man can do, no matter what man tries to do, no matter what he might take away, no matter what he does, God is enough to supply my need. We can be content knowing that we are heirs of Christ's promise, surrounded by Christ's people and infused with Christ's power. Let us find joy, not, not in our prosperity or our poverty, but in Christ, in Christ who is sufficient for us. It is the culmination of the entire letter. Christ is enough for any abuse that we face, for any opposition, for any, any circumstance, persecution, or even death. He is is enough. But is he enough for you? That's a choice you have to make. Are you still in the rat race looking for the cheese? Or have you found Christ? If this morning you're ready to let him be enough, if you're ready to make a change in your life, you say, I'm tired of this, and you're pulling your hair out, you're at your wit's end, as it were. Won't you respond to his invitation while we stand and sing?